that's a kick. <laughs> well, welcome back to the second half. <laughs> and we have an interesting arrangement now that we have in New York, uh, the telecommunication video telecom arrangement is Michael Hart. And uh, sometimes you'll see him on the screen. And sometimes you'll see me or different shots of you guys. And so we're assumedly in dialogue. So Michael, do you hear me? Yep. Can you say something? I can. Oh, great. We, <laughs> we hear you. Yeah. Very good. So, That's good. Uh, yeah, we have progress. Yes. So uh, I told him that you were a vice president of something at Citigroup. And do you want to That's clarify right. that a little? Yeah. Um, I, I would if, if I could have it clarified for myself. Oh. <laughs> I am the uh, Vice President of Information Systems and Strategy. Yes. And what that means is a variety of things, uh, but mainly at the moment trying to get an initiative together for a corporate portal development. Uh, that, that'll that bring our uh, 189,000 employees to one central exchange uh, where they can transact, uh, share analytical information and hopefully transfer these information assets and eventually we'll get to leverage those assets and grow a collective knowledge. Oh, that's, that's great. And I told them that you'd been interacting with us since sometime last spring, is that right? And, that's uh, right. Right, so you know some of the vocabulary. And uh, uh, so did you watch the first session? Were you able to watch it? I saw the last part with uh, Jeff, Jeff from Sun. Yeah. So just, just the bearing and I've of been it. on the phone with uh, Rick from Boston, and we've been discussing the uh, earlier session. Right. Is, uh, <clears throat> is Rick going to be joining us? He's on the line hi. now. Oh, hi, Rick. Hello, hello everybody. Oh. Uh, hey. So, Rick, <laughs> tell us who you are. Mysterious voice out of the hi. room. I'm Rick Swanborg. President and founder of ISIS <laughs> Intellectual Capital Exchange. And it was actually founded <clears throat> five years ago from research I had done at uh, Ernst and Young's Research Center for Information Technology and Strategy. Uh, in addition to uh, building ISICs, I'm also on the faculty. Uh, Boston University, their School of Management, where I uh, in their MBA program, and also participate in their uh, research center for the knowledge economy. So that that's good. We ought, uh, ought to tell you, Rick, that your voice has been breaking up. As you told, I think everybody could understand it basically. So I assume that the audio people will be working on that. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so I told everybody that uh, you'd agree to be on, but you don't have a prepared script and you want to be in a dialogue. And uh, sometimes you've tuned in a little bit to what's been going on. Rick, did you manage to hear the first hour and a half? Unfortunately, I had another meeting that I uh, oh. attended, so I just caught That's the right. last 10 minutes. That's right, okay. But I thought the first thought was very eloquent. <laughs> All right. The, uh, so, uh, you, what we what we warned you to about was that what we'd be interested here is uh, about large organizations such as Citigroup and some of the issues about in in the sort of bootstrapping that we talk about. And we've come up with this concept of oh, it looks like we ought to have a value proposition to tell whoever it is inside of Citigroup that would have to decide how much to invest in the C and the B activities, and uh, especially working outside with NICs and MetaNICs. And uh, 
So this was a, a, an ongoing concern around here. So that's one thing, if we could start some dialogue about that. So, uh, Michael, are you all prepared with that question? <laughs> Just uh, as a, so that you know that we're breaking up, we have a very large echo with everything we say. So I have to pause at the every uh, opportunity so I can hear. Oh, can, oh. Essentially, uh, we have a very difficult problem with coordinating individual and isolated attempts at improving what we do. And there are, as I said earlier, 189,000 people scattered around the globe in 115 different countries. Many of those people engaged in uh, duplicate activity and therein lies a very obvious improvement opportunity. Can they hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. Okay. <laughs> we, we have um, a quality movement in place. We have uh, people involved with very traditional uh, accounting practices that look at metrics uh, to define how we do our work and where there are opportunities to uh, engage in improvement. Uh, we have isolated areas of uh, human resources management where uh, change in initiatives uh, in train to improve the structure and the alignment of uh, the organization and how we go after strategy. Um, we've had in the past total quality management. We have enormous uh, information assets varying from uh, intellectual property rights in the form of trademarks and brands and uh, there, there is an enormous list of uh, intellectual capital assets but nowhere is there one uh, single repository or one single initiative to try and coordinate or uh, track or account for these uh, softer assets. Nowhere is there a single program to attempt to measure the positive effects or otherwise of these improvement efforts. And as such, there's an enormous amount of uh, duplication, an enormous amount of wastage, and we need now to build a case to show that these assets can be brought together in a uh, structured taxonomy and, and be accounted for and measured for growth. And that these uh, seemingly disparate information assets, these uh, disparate processes and these uh, disparate improvement initiatives uh, collectively have greater value than their individual parts. Ask a question just to relieve you a bit. <laughs> you can hear me all right? I can. We're, I'm coming in and out of uh, the screen. I, sometimes you're there and sometimes it's a black screen, so I just have to keep rambling. Yeah, I have a question that, that you, you listed some significant problems that I would guess that are very, very ripe candidates for the corporate corporation to try to remedy. And so a question would be, is, are some of those to any significant extent the kind of things that you would you think your company would be willing to find answers for in a collective thing, like with other financial op outfits joining a, a, a sort of a NIC and, and working on some of those problems in common? There, there are two uh, schools of thought on that. The, the uh, most prevalent uh, is in the more security conscious camp and have more... Um, incentive to go looking at competitive intelligence and that competitive intelligence in itself is an information asset and uh, they would prefer to uh, keep ideas and processes and uh, information goods away from 
competitors and in fact uh, spend their budgets more wisely going after competitive intelligence. So any, any attempts to look at collaboration and cooperation in those people's minds uh, is met with, with opposition. Um, there are areas um, that are more generic and uh, they involve um, people management and uh, organizational development and uh, logistics. These, these things uh, seem to be less competitive and uh, less proprietary and areas where we don't have uh, competence as a population of either banking or financial services or insurance experts. So we would look to share with uh, best practitioners in those areas and we would look at uh, being uh, or making comparison to uh, the best in the logistics area or the best in the human resources area or the best in uh, other areas that we are not seen to be competent, that are not aligned with our uh, core practice of uh, asset transformation. How, how would they judge about where they would look for organizations that have best practices? Well, you know, if we, if we could think of um, just simply uh, supply chain, uh, you know, we could talk about uh, procurement. Um, we, we would spend uh, three to five billion dollars a year on uh, information technology investment uh, in a given year. And we also have to support uh, a large operational infrastructure, and uh, that includes all of the supply and real estate procurement. And um, th these are areas where we've only had to begin to make a business of that, given uh, the scale and scope of the enterprise. These are not practices that insurance companies or bankers or uh, stock brokers have had to engage themselves in, but given uh, the increasing scale and scope of the enterprise, uh, we find ourselves engaged in very complex business that's outside, again, that core practice of uh, transforming assets. Um, so if we're looking at a giant like that, <coughs> and say if, if you ever start looking at your improvement infrastructure, uh, would, that, would that be viewed as some kind of oddity? If, if you or somebody else said, oh, maybe we ought to take stock to see what it is. Is to uh, take stock of ourselves internally to say whether we have an infrastructure. Do, do we actually have an improvement infrastructure? We have made, as I said earlier, attempts at total quality management and at uh, business process re-engineering and all of the um, management ideas that come along with those. And I don't believe that despite uh, strong endeavors from the highest places in the organization, that those programs have ever taken root long enough for uh, the good that is supposed to come of them to be realized. And whilst uh, there have been isolated cases of uh, very high performance across the globe, uh, it, it doesn't ever reach the level of the collective. There's always uh, better and worse practitioners within the organization. So it would take quite a concerted effort uh, and quite a, a deliberate investment in the infrastructure to support that effort to A, build on winning and demonstrating best practices internally to, to gain leverage from those and give momentum to a program and to bring further examples to, to a central um, improvement program. I mean, I, I would think that the uh, first steps would be to establish 
uh, improvement communities within our organization and for there to be uh, momentum towards one collective within the global group and we, we would probably be better uh, served to start looking at uh, micro NICs within our organization and that those NICs could uh, look at collaboration and cooperation externally as well as looking at best practices that were relative to them and relevant to them externally and then bring those experiences of their micro NICs to a more collective group wide initiative. Uh, that sounds sounds workable. Is there any comment here? Uh, um, you know, the first the first time I got to thinking about communities was when I was for a while within McDonnell Douglas, and uh, I began to realize that every time there was a significant kind of improvement action, they had to have people on it from quite a few different divisions to represent their part, and I realized, hey, that's not really. Uh, that's a different kind of a project. It's more like a, com you know, community. So uh, that's when I got particularly interested. So I, I can appreciate that from my experience. I, I think there's there's also uh, a difficulty for people to easily uh, translate uh, good experience in one area and, and bring it directly into their own context. Uh, I've looked recently at um, attempts that we've made to improve uh, communication and uh, if everywhere we look there are uh, obstacles in the way uh, to just getting better at the way we communicate and improving uh, our improvement work in that line alone. So. Uh, as, as we've put metrics around uh, effectiveness and communication and measured uh, how good we are or how poor we are in communication, um, there, there are groups that uh, are showing poorer performance, but they're, they're finding it very difficult to try and translate that into immediate remedies. So there's always, um, there's always obstacles. You know, all, all those obstacles. Like, <laughs> so, if somebody, sort of innocent from the outside, said, uh, uh, "Is there any one place in that big corporation where you'd push the doorbell to say, hey, we would like to talk to you about your improvement infrastructure?" There's some chuckles here. It, it would here. be good, and it, it it might be interesting. I was thinking more about the uh, the supply chain. Uh, technology in terms of the integration efforts that are going on with enterprise resource planning and given uh, that transactional capability and the uh, rules-based and transparent nature of that technology it coupled with the web may in fact give us unwittingly uh, a superb uh, improvement infrastructure. Yeah, not, but on, I, not only does it uh, improve the internal lines, but it also improves the external lines of communication with uh, traders and suppliers within our value chain and within our supply chain. So we're getting increasing uh, connectivity with our external parties from customer through supplier and we're able to get increased transparency and increased information about the activities that are involved in that supply and value chain. And as a indirect benefit, we're getting uh, a lot of improvement data and a lot of improvement information that we're now able to leverage that we didn't expect in our initial investment into uh, the supply chain. Yeah, and I think I think what I believe uh, what you're kind of edging towards to begin to solve this problem for improvement 
is uh, is really dealing with some of the overall cultural issues of you know many large global companies. Um, you know, you can build the best infrastructure and and put in some programs like total quality management and the rest, but it's this culture that that you have to um, build so that people learn that it's it's it, it's good to go and find better practices and better ideas for improvement. I always, I always reflect on one large global company uh, whose CEO truly believed that people should be learning faster and better from others. And, and one of the things he invoked there was a Steal an Idea Award. He gave out a, a award ceremony and, and gave it to people who actually stole ideas, whether they're internally or externally. And it was... It was um, something that set a signal that it was quite okay not to be, uh, you know, innovative and always, you know, trying to come up with new ideas. It's quite okay to grab ideas that were very uh, uh, usable for other groups. And uh, I think that that's one of the, uh, pro probably the toughest things to deal with, especially in the size that, that a city group is, of that kind of the cultural, um, you know, ambivalence to really learning from other groups versus, you know, being... Uh, the creative source of new ideas. Just, just uh, continuing on from that, Rick, um, we've found that uh, trying to build a case for a knowledge exchange uh, is centered on that very notion of incentive. Yeah. And that encouragement of uh, competition or the encouragement uh, to behave in certain ways through a set of incentives uh, has certainly uh, given us uh, business support to improve uh, efforts to invest in the exchange mm -hmm. because the uh, cultural aspects mean that around the globe we have certain individuals and characters who uh, are very selfish uh, in many respects and there isn't in their normal business activity any real need to share their knowledge mm -hmm. so uh, if you have these highly skilled uh, financial engineers who have uh, very secretive relationships with uh, a few clients and they're only doing large value transactions uh, small in number in a given period they are not incented to share their ideas with even their own internal organizational teams in London or in Singapore or in uh, New York they, they will selfishly guard their innovative ideas so that they're first to market right and it's the characteristics of their pricing and and their product and their market dynamics that prevents them from wanting to to work effectively on an exchange of any information or any knowledge. So the uh, incentives have to be skewed to change the yeah. behaviors and change the cultures. See, I, th I think that's one of the critical uh, factors is finding the right incentives so there's enough of a opportunity for people to exchange knowledge so that the overall benefits become uh, available to everybody, uh, but if you don't, and that, that's the key word, it's the exchange. If, if you can't find the incentives that people are getting value out of it, uh, then there's less uh, interest from anybody to uh, collaborate or learn from each other. I, I, I ran into this a bit uh, at a large consulting firm I worked for, where we, um, very, very large consulting firm, where we were trying to build sharing of knowledge, and you know, you would think in the consulting world, you know, consultants would share it gladly because that's core of their business. They're a knowledge uh, group. But uh, we had, uh, the only way we got successful was by uh, setting up a program and even telling people that they could not participate unless they equally traded their knowledge on clients and practices and uh, new uh, methods. Um, and unless they sh they equally traded it, they were were disinvited from the group. But once you've got that that agreement across within um, uh, a group of partners or senior managers, then it, then it worked out quite well. And uh, and I think I would probably 
assume, uh, Michael, that you probably uh, find the same things at Citigroup. Definitely. And I, I could give an example, and I'm trying to bring this back into the context of uh, ha having an, imp an improvement uh, community, how to underpin that with an improvement infrastructure, mm -hmm. how to have a set of measures so that you can have feedback on how you are improving so you can get on to the next phase of improving your uh, improvement process. Now, I have this belief in um, as, as an organization becomes more diverse, uh, its internal market has to become extraordinarily uh, strong and, and increasingly competitive in order to uh, fuel that improvement process. But there needs to be incentives for that to occur because it doesn't necessarily happen on its own. Mm -hmm. And I think we get back to uh, incentives to encourage certain desirable behavior. And they might be in the form of um, the selfish individuals I was referring to earlier. Uh, through the efficiency of a knowledge exchange or an information exchange, if they transact on this exchange, prior to going to the market, not only will they get the bonus or royalty uh, compensation from the transaction that they would have originated and completed, they also should stand to benefit from the uh, bonus or royalty from any subsequent transaction that comes right. as a result of another team within the organization selling that into another market mm -hmm. and uh, it's not very difficult to set up the formula to make those types of incentives available uh, it's, it's more of an issue to create the exchange to allow that to happen uh, very quickly and to bring that level of efficiency into the internal market and it's necessary because the products that these guys are creating have a very long product development, they're very costly, and yet as soon as they've hit the market, their shelf life is very short. They can be uh, de-engineered within two weeks, and any premium that would be attached to those products is uh, eroded by at least 100, uh, by at least 50 percent within a two-week time frame. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's very important because um, I've seen in, in a couple of case studies we've done at Boston University um, where, you know, people think the job is done when they have the knowledge infrastructure in place. Now, I'll, I'll limit infrastructure as the definition of the, the kind of technology and processes, uh, web capabilities, uh, teleconferencing, and the rest. But one company um, that we did a study of, uh, we looked at the, the net effects of after they put in state-of-the-art uh, web capabilities, teleconferencing, because they... They wanted to hook up all their engineers worldwide to solve fairly complex um, construction problems. And um, so these people, uh, their top engineers now could be available uh, to be on call to, uh, you know, handle these construction <laughs> issues. And uh, there was one person, I think, who, who was in London, and, you know, he had, he had a plant that he was supporting, and he was a very bright person, and everybody knew he was one of the brightest people on a particular aspect of, um, of engineering, and so they hooked him up via teleconferencing and the rest, and of course, he's, he's being asked to show up at meetings 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, he's gotten no sleep. Um, he is not getting any of his plant problems solved, and then they wonder why all of a sudden he's not, you know, answering the calls and not collaborating and, and uh, supporting the rest of the corporation. Um, and uh, what they found was that um, there was really uh, not only no incentive for this person, but they weren't really leveraging a lot of his expertise, you know, investing in, in leveraging some of the common problems he kept solving over and over again. And in fact, part of his problem was not so much working 24 hours a day, but just being bored about solving the same issues over and over. 
and I think that that gets into you know beyond the now this you know improvement infrastructure. It begins to get you into how do you start dealing with the cultural issues, the incentive issues, and other things, so that you really leverage this very senior engineer. I, I I'm afraid I have to interrupt that we're coming to the end of the period we can allocate you guys. Uh, so we appreciate that, and some more questions come up in my mind, but uh, I think maybe sometime offline I'll have to go after them with you, Michael. Are, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I hope our contribution's been helpful. I uh, hope we didn't go off on too many tangents. I, I think we'd like sometime to come back and just, just look at things like saying the, the sharing of information, the important part in the strategy thing would be at the sea level, which is different from the kind of A level that you mentioned there, uh, et cetera. So it'd be interesting just to see, but you have to get a, a sort of a specified sea activity going so people recognize it to do it. But anyway, it, it would be very exactly. interesting. They have to see that, they have to see that uh, immediate value. Right. Value proposition, that's what we're after. <laughs> so anyway, so I respect whatever value proposition drove you to this expense of time and energy to tie to us. <laughs> so we appreciate it very much, Michael and Rick. So thank you. We'll give you an applause, okay? So I'd like to get in touch with you in a couple of days on the phone just to thank you and talk it over, okay? Can you wave at us? Thank you. Hey, Thank you. Good deal. <laughs> okay. And thanks to the crew back here, too, for making that work. And, uh, anyway. So they, they had to scurry because the idea only came up yesterday. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Uh, so um, I think without my diving into any of my slides or something, I'll... I'll turn it over. I'll give you all fair warning that what you're likely to experience now. <laughs> See, he's even calming his... Anyway, my old friend Ted Nelson, who I guess we got acquainted 35 years ago or something? 67. 33 years ago. <laughs> when he, he was a very young man at the time. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, it's been great. And... Uh, He's off there. We're off in different places waving at the world and once in a while we wave at each other and uh, we can share a lot of the experiences of trying to wave at the world and not quite sure whether we hear anything back. And, uh, but he keeps going and so do I. And he's got some really interesting things. So one of the things I would just like to tell everybody is when we talk about trying to get something going that's an evolutionary process, and evolutionary open hyper document system go there that's open for evolution, I think it'd be extremely valuable to be able to integrate the kind of things we're trying to do with the kind of things he talks about because something in the fusion of those things would be very important. So, okay, you can stand up and get your microphone while I'm trying to find your... Uh, Hello? <clears throat> Good luck. Hello. Hello. Am I on? Is, is the microphone working? Hello? Speaking to the folks in the back? In the Be the nice to him. He's a pretty good kid. <laughs> <laughs> One time he got, he, he was going to make a movie and he, he needed somebody to play the role of his father. So I don't know how he did it, but he talked me into it. <laughs> <laughs> At a Rogers house, no less. Oh, yeah. Okay. So take it away. Yeah, think of it. <clears throat> when we speak of evolution, we don't necessarily mean cooperation. We don't necessarily mean an enjoyable or nice process. Nature, remember, is red and tooth and claw. And the results of evolution may be wondrously integrated and charming and beautiful, but uh, the, uh, those parties along the way who participate in it may not have a very good time. It's my job, it is not my job to be cooperative. It is not my job to uh, try to find 
common threads in what we're all doing. It is my job to be the conscience of what we should be doing because I believe that everything is totally, hopelessly ghastly and wrong and that we have to basically start over. Let us consider <coughs> the um, prevailing paradigm. I don't, oh, I see. Let's consider the prevailing paradigm of computers, the uh, so-called computer literacy. The beginners are told, oh, they come so innocently. They say, oh, I'm so afraid of this. I'm going to break it. I'm not computer, I'm not computer literate. <coughs> I, I trained it. <coughs> <coughs> so they learn that we have these operating systems, which must be approached in a certain way. And then we have GUIs, which are, of course, very different between the Macintosh, the PC, and X-Windows. <clears throat> and we must learn to use files and name them correctly, of course, with different sets of rules. And then once we understand those things, we learn about applications. And, of course, the basic applications are word processing, spreadsheet, and database, and the way we move things back and forth between these things is through the so-called clipboard, which is, allows us to cut and paste. And copy. And copy. I believe this paradigm, which is, of course, you see, paradigms tend to be invisible. You only see paradigms as a rule in contrast to other paradigms, at which point you get another, a sort of stereo view, where you, begin, you see a difference image and you say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. This paradigm, I consider an abomination. It must be swept away because it is at the heart of everything that is wrong with what people try to do with computers. It is, and every beginner is absolutely correct in saying, I don't like this. <laughs> and for very good reasons. I, ha I just visited Norway, and a cousin of mine, Anna Paus, said, I won't use computers because you can't see the previous version of what you're working. I said, exactly. The beginners know something the experts don't because they have not been steeped, they have not been pickled long enough <coughs> in what we think of as the solution. Okay. Now, the problem with paradigms, there are many interesting things about paradigms. I could go on forever. I'm trying to stop using the term and say idea fields because <clears throat> paradigms, you see, are big ideas that are essentially invisible, uh, uh, a soup in which we, do not, which we do not discern, whereas you can have smaller idea fields, and really it's fractal because little idea fields and big idea fields are the same except they come in all sizes. But the great problem is that you cannot express one paradigm in terms of another. People say to me, why don't you, under why don't you explain this in terms I can understand? Because if you, knew the ter if you understood the terms, you'd understand the paradigm. You would understand my ideas already. Unless you can walk through the door into the new ideas which cannot possibly be expressed in your words, there's no hope for communication. See, Everything that can be done with frankfurters and cheese and pickles has been done. Um, when, uh, when innocent people ask me, well, you know, word processing, spreadsheet, and database, that's basic, right? I mean, see, it's like, it's a, it's like trying to explain cuisine to somebody who, uh, the concept of cuisine cuisine to someone who's only eaten at McDonald's and they say cuisine what could it possibly mean you put the um, the fries in the shake or you uh, put the shake and the fries and the burger next to each other or possibly you put the fries up your nose and the burger on your head and pour the shake all over you I mean, th these are the possibilities but you see, there are other possibilities which don't involve burgers and fries and shakes. And for that, you have to get out of the burger fries shake paradigm, and that can be very difficult. You cannot express one paradigm in terms of another, and there is no neutral terminology. Because every, termi every terminology set is paradigm tinged. Now, you could, for example,
program Lisp under Mathematica, but then you'd be working in a basically Mathematic environment in which your Lisp functions would be working. You could program Mathematica under Lisp, and now you'd be basically working in a Lisp environment. The which one is at the center, is at the top, determines the flavor of the whole. It's like uh, ordering a steak in a fish restaurant, you'll get kind of a fishy steak probably, and ordering a fish in a steak restaurant, you'll get a kind of a steaky fish. The point is that the whatever, whatever is at the center affects the rest. So, computer religions take on their compelling quality because we all know viscerally that whichever is at the center will determine the character of the whole. I think of this as, this as undermining. In the computer field we always say, well you could implement yours under mine. <laughs> and what that means of course is that yes, it would have the flavor of what I want, but it would really be your system after all. Now, this is very similar to the issue of making movies. I, I started as a movie maker. I made one film before the one Doug referred to, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it spoiled me for life. I believe that software design, especially the design of interactive software, is literally a branch of filmmaking. And nobody's discovered that yet, you see. Um, Movies are events on a screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer. Interactive software is events on a screen that affect the heart and mind of a viewer and interact. Oh, also they may have some side effect in terms of data. But the interaction with the heart and mind may very well be primary. This is the reason that video games are so much better made than office software because video games are created by people who want to play video games and office software is are created by people who are on salary and haggle endlessly about inconsequential detail. And the guy who gets to design the interface for the Microsoft Word word count routine is probably getting that interface design as his reward for having written the word count routine itself. Now if you made movies this way the person in the costumes could sew them any way they liked. The person who, uh, who wrote the music could write any old music. The photographer could do it any way he liked, and you'd get quite a pastiche. And it took the film industry from roughly 1893 to 1904 to discover the director. The director, instantiated first by Griffith and Porter, was somebody who did not necessarily know how to sew a costume, a costume dance, even load a camera, but who knew what the overall effect was and how to adjust each portion of that whole thing to get the overall effect. Now in software, there are no directors except in interactive gaming. I think some of the people we know come close to it. I actually think that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs are probably closer to directors than anybody else because they have actually integrated the software and that's why Macintosh and PC software halfway a sign just appeared, I, I, saying, put on a mic. Finding it, however, oh. <clears throat> right. That's why it works to some extent, that somebody has been integrating it. But the problem is that all the des design decisions have been made by those few guys, and everybody else has to operate within the world they have created, and within the rules for... Um, naming files, etc., etc. Let me talk a little about files, because nobody, they say the fish doesn't see the water, nobody quite sees what an abominable burden is put on the user by the very nature of files as we know them. Now, you have to put the data somewhere and you have to maybe find some way of referring to it, but the fact that files are stuck lumps in fixed places with fixed names obtrudes in every possible way into the user's thought and environment and always to the detriment of what you're trying to do. So that we have ever so many workarounds 
to the file system. We have ways of naming small parts like mailboxes and, and uh, playlists. We have uh, uh, aliases and uh, shortcuts which give access to that, stuck, that whole stuck lump. But nowhere at the system level do we have a clean way of referring to the individual parts that we should be able to refer to. But that doesn't even get to the main problem. The main problem, I believe, is that we have to deal with contents which overlap. We have to deal, deal with showing in overlapping contents and structures and interpenetrating connections among contents and structures. And all software is clueless about these things. Now, why is that? Basically, it's because we have, because the computer world was built by techies with kind of rectangular imaginations. And they were deeply rewarded, richly rewarded, for doing really dumb, clunky things that got some leverage. And we never got on to the next part. So with that, let me get on to the next part. If I, uh, hmm, I never saw that title. Uh, how do I get, I don't know, this is, we're in, we're in, there we are. All right. So we now have. Do you want to make sure we can just, this one button. Wonderful. How may I please put this okay. there? Thank you. You wave at the nice guys up there. Hi. Here we have. On this screen here, you'll shortly see. If you could see what I see here on this screen. Hello? Yeah. Seems to be connected. <clears throat> yes. All right. So the fundamental issue is the question of how to display interconnection and parallelism of structure. Hey, ah, thank you. Okay, this picture uh, I published in 1972. I think this may give us a close-up of it. Uh, Doug, you said it was the, con there we are. Here's the close-up, which shows contents in one window deeply connected to contents in another. This is the problem. I'm going to leave this on the screen for some minutes because I want you to understand that this is what we need, this is what we've always needed, and there is no alternative, and it has to be at the bottom. Therefore, everything we have is wrong. And the reason I'm shouting is that I published this in 1972. Okay, now, this is the 1998 version, which we implemented. See, the <coughs> people looked at this and said, oh, Ted doesn't understand how computers work. Thank you very much. So here is a, this was an animated implementation I did in 1998 with uh, Ian Heath at the University of Southampton. If you could see it animated, which I could do if we weren't stuck with Microsoft PowerPoint or oh, <laughs> weakness point, we would be able to see we would be able to see the, movie, the windows moving around, the content scrolling, and the lines adhering to the content within the windows. Why do we not have this? When I spoke at Xerox Park, I don't know when it was, 19, late 94, early 95, I said, this is what we must have. They said, when are you going to put, add that to your windows? They said, oh, we'll get around to it real soon now, Ted. 70, right after Computer Lib. So they've had enough time. I believe Xerox Park is where most of the things went wrong in the computer world. And uh, <clears throat> they've made their money. There's no need to be nice anymore. <laughs> I don't need any favors from them. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the point is that this is what we should have, period. And, uh, and anything short of it is wrong. And there's nothing, in the, there's nothing on the horizon like it in the conventional computer world. And to the best of my knowledge, no one is accepting the challenge because to accept this challenge is to walk through the paradigm door to something entirely different. Entirely different. <clears throat> so I've been working now for 40 years to attempt to get this stuff up. Now this is the most recent visualization. This was done in August of 1999. This is a front end done by Ka Ping Yi, who works by day at ILM for uh, the code formerly known as Xanadu 88, described in my book, Literary Machines, and continually shepherded by its co-designer, Roger Gregory. So this is being fed by the Xanadu backend, now called Udinax Green, and available in open source. What you see here is the, on the right-hand side is the Declaration of Independence in the version we, know, we all know, and a previous draft of the, of the Declaration in per, of Independence. Algorithmically displayed are all the transclusions showing which parts are the same and which parts, and the gray parts are not the same. This is what we need. We need deep 
intercomparison of documents side by side, which exactly shows the differences among their content. Uh, we've had this server, uh, well, it's, uh, we had the server in 88 due to an unfortunate political foul up at Autodesk. It was not released, and, and they went on to try to design something else. That server is now uh, available in open source, and if anybody wants to work with it, see Roger. Ping was able to write this front end in Python in a couple of weeks strictly from the interface specs, and it worked. So this is, this is all very good, very good. Unfortunately, the stuff is not adequately documented. It's mainly in Roger's head. I get some of it out every few weeks <coughs> and, uh, and try to put it on the web. But we're, that's another, that's another uh, slowdown. So this is, what, this is what, as I said, we need. These are various forms of it. There is no alternative. There is no compromise. And there is no way that I know to retrofit it to the existing structure. Um, there's something going on called XML, which some say is um, <clears throat> HTML done right. I think that's probably a good description. A wrong thing done to absolute perfection. <laughs> and I've been on the mailing list of the XML linking committee, which is endeavoring to create some kind of a specification or standard for hyperdocuments that will appropriately represent connective structure. My experience in reading these posts convinces me further, as if I hadn't known already, that I want nothing to do with it. And uh, what I'm doing continues in another direction. OK. <clears throat> I guess at this point I should tell you, make a few other points. Parallel interpenetrating structure, then, is the challenge. Yet for some reason, Everyone has said computers are hierarchical. Why are they hierarchical? Because we made them that way. Hierarchy is something that came down to us from military organizations and the Catholic Church mostly. <clears throat> and, and I was told by one scholar that the reason that Aquinas was backed by the Catholic Church had to do with some yabba dabba ding dong fight. But the point is that we have fetishized hierarchy as a kind of structure, thinking that this is real structure, which is preposterous. It is a degenerate, trivial case into which we've attempted to for force everything else. Whereas the whole point is to deal with parallel interpenetrating structures and allow hierarchy and sequence and tables, the three structures were allowed on computers, to allow those to be the, parallel, the, the trivial cases they really are and to deal with the hard stuff. But doing, the, doing this trivial thing and saying that it's the real thing and convincing the world that it's the real thing has been an astounding snow job and has to be undone. Okay, so All right, let me just tell, talk about what I'm working on now. First of all, the Xanadu 88 source is available, Roger's working on it. We want to get this out there and we want people to use it. Let me say a couple of things about how that's built. Uh, we have now disclosed as much as we have time for of the, uh, of the secrets. They're now no longer officially secret. The Enfilade, which is a uh, structure I came up with with two friends in 1972, was essentially a tree structure with parameters which either summated upward or were imposed downward. Um, the enfilade theory is discovered by Roger, Mark Miller, and Stuart Green in 1979, led to the design of the Udenax Green software. I'll run through this quickly because some of you care and most of you don't. <clears throat> the point is that the, uh, that sort of software is built on three enfilades. The grand filade in which you have a uh, summative, uh, <clears throat> summative count of characters upward, which essentially keeps track of... Uh, of the entire universe of structure as mapped into our linear address space, which is based on transfinite arithmetic, which both Mark and Roger happen to have in their backgrounds. At the address of each version of a document is another enfilade structure called a pumfilade, or permutation order of matrices enfilade, which essentially is a permutation matrix in tumbler spans of the current position of every character or element in that version of the document. And the third, uh, the third, the third enfilade structure, essentially, the, the span filade is the same 
that, that second same structure map to find all the overlaps in the grand address space. This is extremely radical stuff, was when they discovered it 20 years ago, still is, and it basically works. So this is uh, <coughs> of great interest to those of you who want to deal with huge address structures and who want to deal with large-scale overlap and permutation and document management. Okay, what I'm doing now is a little different. I'm interested both in the problem of, the, of documents, but also in the original dream of computers as I saw it and as many people saw it. I saw computers as a way of organizing things. Nobody can organize their lives on a computer unless they are, have incredibly simple lives and spent a hell of a lot of time using the existing rotten, stupid tools. Because, here's an example. Uh, my colleague at uh, Keio University, Professor Umegaki, comes to me with a project he calls hypergenealogy. He wants to chart the history of the Meiji era in Japan and who met whom when and what the different meetings were about. And he said that the database guys say to him, oh, you've got to decide in advance what all your fields are going to be. Well, that's how it is in the database world. You have to decide everything in advance. I guess that's how they feel about things. <clears throat> but for some of us, ideas keep changing and you have to be able to change those fields all the time. Well, that's where the database guys get off the boat, but they still get paid handsomely enough and so they aren't about to change that model. And the same goes for everything else. Word processing is the most trivial and degenerate operation anyone could imagine. It's, okay, I've made this point before. MIDI is a geek's notion of music because you look at the notation and you go bompity, bompity, bompity down that notation and there it is, music, just like it says in the notation. In other words, mistaking the superficial appearance of what that notation appears to contain for all that it contains. Whereas musical notation as seen by those who really know it contains all kinds of metastructures blossoming out of it that are not visible to the only slightly trained. Okay, similarly, the problem of writing is about rewriting. Especially rewriting, okay, if you're doing a novel, an encyclopedia, a book of history, the issue is not the fiddly little stuff you can do in a small window on a screen. The issue is how to massively rearrange and keep track of large pieces of content. And anybody who's done this knows that it has nothing to do with word processing as, as presently constituted. It has to do with being able to find all the pieces and be able to keep track of where they were in previous documents and rearrange them. Now, I have a, an extreme grudge here against I, both the Parkies and the Macintosh team. Because when they came out with the Macintosh, they also ruined two holy words. The, uh, when I, my first job was as a copy boy on the New York Times when I was a, between my first and second years of college. <clears throat> and the very first thing I did every morning was to fill the paste pots. And what did you do with the paste pots? You cut and you pasted. And what did that mean? It meant taking a draft and cutting it and putting all the pieces in front of you on the table and saying, let's see. This should go here. That, that's probably the best lead. Okay, I'll put this over here, then this, and getting a sequence of those materials as a parallel consideration of all the parts, looking, looking at them simultaneously, and then actually using physical paste to put them in order. Okay? And this process was used by everybody. I have one, one source, according to one source, Tolstoy would cut up his manuscripts and leave them along. He'd make two copies. His daughters, two daughters would <coughs> take his dictation. Then he'd save one for the file and cut up the other and leave the pieces of it all over the floor of his dacha Yasnaya Polyana. And as he walked into the woods, he would call back, don't touch my noodles. And this was cut and paste, as it has been carried on since time immemorial by serious writers. So what did they do when they devised an abominable mechanism for transporting stuff between one application and another. A place where you would put things that you could not see the contents and which would destroy whatever was previously there if you happened to forget that there was something there. Why they called it a clipboard. And of course it resembled a clipboard in every respect except that you couldn't see it and it destroyed the things on it before. <coughs> now of course, unfortunately there are no other respects. So 
instead of calling these, these things, these functions, um, uh, hide and plug, which would have been a neutral terminology, or I, in a slightly less ter neutral terminology using the keys which are conventional, control C, control V for cram and vomit, <laughs> <coughs> they call these things cut and paste. And I have for some, for some years said that whoever, whoever chose those words should be hanged because that is one of the principal cultural atrocities of the 20th century. And the fact that millions of people lose valuable content every year because the phone rings or for some other damn reason because this brain-dead mechanism is created. Okay, I can now tell you who it was. Don't blame the car because that changed quite a bit before they got phone. Larry Tesler says it was he. <laughs> <laughs> and, he unless... <laughs> okay. Well... But, but, but that, use no. of the, that use of the terms is yours? No, no, no. They, okay. That, that was floating around in the 60s before. Right. Cut and paste, I know where, I know when that was done. Okay, and that, you, you were mixed up with Larry on that. Yeah, it first appears in a paper called, called IT for Intuitive Typewriter. Well, <coughs> basically, I have suspended my fatwa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh, you, shall, you shall walk forever in peace. But, uh, but uh, I do think it is, it's a horrible thing. <laughs> and and, and may, may it weigh heavily on your conscience always. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the real problem is how to create parallel mechanisms for the, con for, the, for the deep consideration of alternative structures. And that's what we have to deal with. So I think I had some bullet points to get to. Let me fire them off. Oh, yes, here we are. So this is my notion of what a, what a text editor should look like one version of it. So here, let's say you're almost always going from a previous version to a next version, and you want to see where the contents came from. So here you have a, here you have a document called Software Philosophy Long Version, and you pull across this paragraph, saying it is certainly the case software is never exactly one another, and you see a stripe showing its origin, which remains in place, as in this paragraph here, showing you where it came from. Now I showed that to my to my uh, my uh, whatever it is, distant cousin Anna Paus in Norway. She says, "Yes, that's what I want," and she says, "He's the one who refuses to use computers." This is what writers need. At least a lot of writers. This is what I want as a writer, and it's what is denied to us because uh, of the simple mechanisms we've been forced to use. Let me show you my 1965 version of that, just for historical interest. This was the uh, this was the original sketch. I did for, uh, for my paper for the ACM in 1965. Each of these is meant to be one uh, vertical, long vertical document, and this shows that some of the elements are, are the same, transcluded, and this shows that they're merely linked. So that's a slightly more abstracted view. But the point is, I believe we need to be able to see the connections among structures and that this is the principal thing that is missing. Okay, so what I'm doing now <coughs> is trying to start over. I believe we must start over, that there is no way, no way, whatever, to get to where we should be from where we are, except by an extremely radical start. So for the last 30 years in, in ever escalating outrage as the personal computer revolution took, uh, took its toll, <coughs> I've been trying to figure out where the hell to start, given that there were only tools which lock you into somebody else's paradigm. Okay? You could not, there was nothing you can do that doesn't lock you in someplace. Whether it's, yes, you can do all kinds of things in, in Director, and you can, you can build your own web browser in Director, but now you're stuck with that. You can go over to Microsoft Classes. You can do things based on database. There's nothing, nothing cannot be the center. But on the other hand, every one of these centers is completely freighted with the existing paradigm of file structures, big named lumps that you're stuck with, application prisons owned by individual companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Linux world will excuse me, but that's just exactly the same. The difference between X Windows and the Macintosh and the, and the PC, as far as I'm concerned, is like the difference between chimpanzee and human DNA, inconsequential. <laughs> so the, whole, the real point is to find out how we grow wings not how we make another chimp. <clears throat> okay. And we cannot, you can't get there from here. You can't bolt wings on a car and, and, and make it fly. 
So the real question is, where is the fulcrum? Archimedes did not say, but let's use the quote anyway, mm -hmm. give me a fulcrum and, I, I can, and a lever long enough and I'll move the world. So I think I found a good fulcrum. Is this a warning? We'll go off the air in about two minutes. Okay. <coughs> I believe I found a, a minimal unit of structure from which all of the structures can be constructed. It is the zigzag multidimensional structure, which uh, I'm tended, toying with calling it the Kahoot, uh, which allows objects to be referenced at all sorts of interpenetrating inter levels. And uh, <coughs> after the, after the, uh, after the uh, prototype was built by Andrew Pam of Australia, and I, I have a few boot floppies with me, a young postdoc in Finland named Thomas J. Luca has caught fire on it and is now uh, working on a version at sourceforge.net entitled GZZ for zigzag, which will be open source. On top of this, I have designed a system which I call Floating World. Floating World is intended to be an alternative universe for the computer user that has, in which files, applications, and all of the other <coughs> furniture of our perverted computer universe can be discarded in favor of an interpenetrating universe of structures, documents, and programs which are spatial in n and a half dimensions and which allow you beginners to program and build their own environments. We hope to leverage some of the powers of the extraordinary 3D boards to give us three-dimensional views of these structures, of course, three being any three out of n at a time. I mean, can't be greedy. <coughs> and. Uh, and uh, the first zigzag conference is tentatively scheduled for Finland this October. I should also add that any university students wanting credit for work on this system are welcome at Uvascula University. It's only three and a half hours north of Helsinki by train. <coughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it's got, a fine, it's got some fine restaurants and some great people. So to wrap up, uh, we, have, we have a quark of structure from which we may yet build a new cosmology. Can, uh, how do people learn about it? Uh, you can go to xanadu.com and uh, slash zigzag. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, some of the links are broken there. I haven't had time to fix them. But, uh, but we're continually posting new stuff on there. It's can, a multidimensional discrete structure. Can we cut and paste out of it? To... Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to hide and plug real soon now. <laughs> well, I thank you. Um, thank you So, you know, the, the, third, the third period of this is down at the pizza and Mexican food, et cetera. So if people want to migrate down there, I, I think he said he'd come along. And I don't know how many of the other of you, uh, but it, it's a good place to talk and sort of unwind. But you can stay here and unwind for a little while, too. <laughs>